Digging through our comments section, at least after it's been moderated, is a fascinating affair. We get some really great insights into what you, our viewers, find interesting and also the questions that you'll want answered. And today we're going to dive in and answer one of those questions. Why do 800 volt batteries matter? Manufacturers, particularly high performance manufacturers, have been moving to 800 volt or more power systems. But now we're starting to see mid-range vehicles like the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6 coming out with what's called an 800 volt architecture. But what is it? And does it really matter? And if so, why? But first, we're no strangers to technology. You know the rules and so do I. A full subscription to what I'm thinking of. Plus hitting the notification bell. You wouldn't get this from any other channel. And if you want me to stop or carry on with the 80s lyrics, don't forget to support the channel. I'll tell you how at the end of the video. You can do it from under $1 a month. Okay, let's go back in time for a moment. Back in the 1960s and 70s, 36, 48 and 72 volt systems ruled the EV boost. With 6 volt lead acid batteries, you needed a whole bunch of them to get enough power to move along at any speed over any significant distance. Gradually, we've seen voltages trend upwards, first to 100-ish, then to 400-ish, and now with vehicles from the eGMP platform from Hyundai Kia, the Ultium platform from GM, up to cars like the Porsche Taycan built on its J1 platform, the Lucid Air, and even the Rimac Nevera, we're seeing 800 volts or even higher. So first up, why has that happened? Let's think for a moment about the EV charging experience. Not the over 80% of charging that's done at home while you sleep, but those long road trips that so dominate the minds of many, where a charging time of 30 minutes to an hour before moving on, which you and I might find perfectly acceptable, but for some people it feels like it would be a huge inconvenience. As EV adoption increases, decreasing time spent at rapid charging stations will also become more pressing, particularly on holidays where there is a lot of travel. With Tesla and its supercharger network increasing in popularity, we've already seen queues at busy periods. If you've paid a cool 2.5 million for your Rimac Nevera, then waiting with the proles for an hour isn't going to be high on your bucket list. But it's not just about charging time. Pulling those shiny electrons from the battery to the motor requires transferring a lot of power. If you're going for a performance EV, at lower voltages you need thicker cables to get the power there, and that means extra weight. And low voltage plus high current draw means more heat, which is wasted energy. So one, why does that happen? And two, what can we do about it? Well, we need to take you back to high school, back to the physics lab. So sit yourself down on the stool and don't play with the Van de Graaff generator. And let's just remind you that the amount of power transferred, the number of watts, is equal to the volts times the amps. So to get lots of power from your battery pack to your motor, you want either a lot of volts or a lot of amps or, shockingly, both. A quick and simple analogy for thinking about this is hose pipes. No, bear with me. If you've got a fire hose and a little, ideally compostable straw, and you attach a pressure gauge to the end of each of them, and you attach the other end to a tap and turn them both on full, both of them will read that same pressure. That, for our purposes, is the voltage. Now imagine that you want to wash a car, so you need a bucket of water. At least, so I've heard, I don't really wash cars. Pop the pressure valves off and try to fill a bucket with your straw and a bucket with your fire hose. That flow of water you can think of as being the current, known as amps. And assuming that your imagination works broadly the same way as mine, you'll be thinking that the fire hose will fill the bucket first. And it will. Although the voltage, or in this case the pressure, is the same, you can pass a lot more liquid through the fire hose quickly than you can through the straw. That thin tube, or in our EV, wire produces much greater resistance to flow than the bigger tube. So when you have a lot of wire trying to carry a lot of current to, say, an electric motor, the wire gets hot and is more likely to melt. Somewhat of a problem if you're trying to do the Col de Torini. 
So you can tackle this in a number of ways. The simplest is you can make your wire bigger. At the subatomic level, when we're looking at protons and electrons, the electrons don't flow in a nice straight marching band line down the wire. In fact, they barely move at all. They bump into each other and get in the way. So increasing the diameter of the wire means that you can get a lot more of them to meander that short distance. But increasing the wire size has a bunch of problems. First, it's expensive. Copper is about the cheapest decent material for automotive wire, and it's not cheap. It's also heavy. A typical EV contains at least 80 kilos or around 180 pounds of copper. Some of that's in the motor, but a big chunk is in the wiring. To counter that weight, you'd need bigger batteries and a more powerful motor, which will then pull more power, so then you'd need thicker wires and... Oh, bother. So, what else could you do? You could use a better quality wire, like a slipperier tube. Reduce the resistance in the wire. That could be a purer wire. Imperfections in the copper are like little rocks in the way of your flow, but each little improvement in purity is a big increase in cost. Alternatively, you could use a different wire material. There are wire materials out there that are way better conductors and that have similar ductility. Ah, that's bendiness to mere mortals like us. Silver, for example, is about one third more conductive and has better bendiness, but it also costs 10 times more. Fine if you're building a one-off hypercar, not so great for your luxury sports sedan. You could cool the cables. That actually stops the atoms in the wire getting in the way of the electrons. But to cool it enough to make a significant difference is expensive and probably impossible in a car, both in terms of the thickness of insulation you'd need and the energy required to get the wire cold enough. To give you an idea, copper's conductivity doesn't really massively improve until you get down to around 60 degrees Kelvin, which is a balmy minus 233 Celsius or minus 370 Fahrenheit. Not an entirely convenient temperature to try and generate, let alone maintain, outside of a lab. Which takes us to increasing the voltage. Double the voltage, and you need half as much current to get the same amount of power. Even with smaller cables, you can get more power to the motor with a lower amount of current. In the US, where split phase 120 volt nonsense rules the roost for power outlets in houses, that's why cookers and dryers have dedicated 240 volt lines. Twice the voltage, half the current, the same amount of power overall. This means that even with smaller cables, you can get more energy to the motor with a lower amount of current. Less current means less heat and less energy wasted. This is a much smaller version of the technique used with power transmission lines. Electricity grids are run at very high voltages, in the US up to 500,000 volts in places. There are other more complicated effects that come into play at such high voltages, but in general, the principles are the same. Higher voltages allow a lower current to transmit the same amount of power. You get reduced losses through heat and resistance in the cable, and you can use thinner, lighter cables. And that benefit isn't just felt in the car. Where else might you want to use thinner, lighter cables around EVs? Charging stations. Anyone who's handled a 350 kilowatt CCS liquid-cooled rapid charging cable on a rapid charger will know that they can be somewhat cumbersome and are not the lightest things in the world. So you can see why switching to higher voltage powertrains is increasingly popular. If you want high performance and sub 20 minute charge time so your owners don't have to hang out with the plebs, or you just want a quick charge time on any EV and you don't want to have to deal with a cable that's like trying to maneuver a Yugo 45 on a dark and frosty night, you're gonna need an 800 volt system. So while most automakers have been using 400 volts, over the next few years you can expect to see 800 volts spread as the new standard for new EVs, particularly for anything with a performance bent. At the cheaper end of the market, 400 volts probably has still got quite a bit of life in it. Thankfully, the CCS chargers are backwards compatible, so even us peasants charging at under 150 kilowatts, we can still plug in without a worry. We'll just have to be there a while longer. That's it for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back with more soon. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to leave your thoughts below. Or in our free to join Discord chat room, there's also a link down there. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take Two, and give the bell a gentle 
ding to make sure you're told when the next video goes live. And of course, check your notification settings. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Chris Asenta, and Denny Hyde, and our Deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Feeling left out? You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!